All right, we are back and it is time for another episode of the Pencil Kings podcast. Today we are talking with Kirsten Zirngebel. I hope I did that right. Uh, but Kirsten, we've just been talking a little bit and I've never we've never had this situation on the podcast before, so I'm so excited to talk about it and I just want to preface the conversation a little bit. So we're going to talk about when you're doing something really cool, but your art doesn't necessarily fit in with something that is already existing. And now that's just my take on where things are at right now. So I'm sure Kristen, has, she's thought way more about this. Um, but just right now, like when I'm looking at her work, uh, I can't immediately say, oh, just go here and talk to these people and, and they need this um, because the work is amazing uh, as fine art. But, you know, f- there's, there's also the it seems like it can really be have a, a practical application, although I'm struggling a little bit to find out exactly what that is. So I'm excited to talk to Kristen. Welcome to the call today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I uh, got over my cold, and I am um, I am feeling clear-headed and uh, ready to dig into this. Yeah. So I feel like it's a little bit difficult to understand what we're talking about uh, just from audio format. So could you kind of verbally describe your work so that maybe people, if they're not able to get to uh, your website, which is Kirsten Zirngable, it's okay. I'm just going to spell it out here for you. K-I-R-S-T-E-N-Z-I-R-N-G-I-B-L.com. I know it's a mouthful, but we'll also have the link over at pencilkings.com slash podcast. Um, but can you give us a verbal description of how you would explain this to somebody who was say blind and <laughs> like I, I've got my eyes closed right now and I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna see if, if you can explain it a little bit so that the, the audio listeners can understand well let's see this is um hand prepared myself to answer this question but it's a good one so I've done a lot of different work and you can see a bunch of different stuff on my website but the stuff I'm really about lately um is what I'd call structural abstraction or even better architectural abstraction and um, and it's not even quite abstraction. It, it hovers in this border between science fiction and abstraction. <laughs> and uh, so I'm really into environments and uh, you know deep space kind of work that 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 just deals with like really complex scenes. Uh, but the scenes are not fully descriptive of you know any one given place. They're a little bit more and open to interpretation at least to the viewer i i have stuff that they're about and I'm, I'm doing a terrible job at this let me try to back up again um, no 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 i think it's i think it's pretty good you uh, hit you hit on a couple things i think are really can help to understand this so it's very architectural it's all about in, or environments or at least this new work this, the work yeah. that we're going to talk about today it's it's abstract so i think you can go into a little bit more detail like how you're abstracting things but we can yes. get into that yeah. and it's complex like there's a lot of detail and there's a lot of layers that that are in these works and i i feel like color is also a very important part that the colors are i'm just going to say fantastical <laughs> uh, that, that i feel like you know some of them are, are feel more realistic but then other ones are they're just brighter and and they're using things that you know palettes that maybe we don't commonly see at least not in the north american sphere i i feel feel like in other places in the world these these bright colors are are, could be more prevalent but in north america we don't see them as much well why don't i why don't i back up and and talk about some of the things driving the work some of the things i really like and then that way you can kind of piece together you know what more of what it's about okay so i um I've always had this fascination with self-similarity and um, symmetry and just uh, mathematical beauty, recursion, uh, fractals, that kind of thing. I have a a reverence for that and I I want to try to celebrate that in my work and it's also a theme in the stories I work on. And to explain emergence, it's the idea of, um, I think a concise way to put it would be uh, a whole bunch of little components that together become greater than the sum of their parts. Uh, where complex relationships in them create something that's, I wouldn't call it lifelike, but something that is more complex. So the, the idea of complexity from more of a math and science uh, perspective really drives me. And, you know, as a kid, I also, I really loved, um, like, modular building toys and Legos. And I, I really try to bring that toy-like aspect into my work as well. And so you can kind of, you can kind of see that in, you know, some of my recent work. And, um 
So, you know, I, I work in, I, I love 3D. I, I've, uh, I've uh, you know, I'm self-taught in 3D software, but to me it's like working with Legos when you have, when you can make your own pieces and you yes. have infinite pieces. And, yes. and it's just, it's the, it's the best of all worlds there. And it's just really gratifying to me. And so I went to, you know, I went to continue with this very hybrid 2D, 3D approach. And um, so some other things driving me. So I have uh, something called synesthesia and also ideasthesia. And so what those are, are um, and I've only really become more introspective and aware of them in the past couple of years. Uh, but what they are, they're, um, you know, inescapable mental associations between either symbols like graph beams, like numbers or letters and uh, colors and shapes. I see them in my mind's, <clears throat> excuse me, I see them in my mind's eye in association also with some um, abstract thoughts. And so as I think, I see um, shapes moving together, they'll cancel each other out um, where they overlap. So they'll basically be doing like Boolean operations on each other. And um, I also see uh, time as a third dimension. So I'll see like 2D shapes. And as I think they're kind of moving through space, but I'm looking in time and it forms um, a 3D shape. And this is all, this is not nearly as precise as uh, um, it sounds. I, I quickly forget what these things are. They're more like impressions. But I found that I can use these tools to try to capture uh, what I think. And so the science fiction aspect of all the stuff I'm working on is imagine if you used uh, technology uh, to, to basically simulate the same kind of phenomenon. So uh, the idea of a personal operating system, uh, the idea like something where you can literally see your shot, your thoughts and share your thoughts with others and they're encoded in this, um, these abstract forms. And, but you know, this, this is all like post singularity kind of science fiction. It's, it's, it's kind of out there, but what's excites me so much is that nobody's really tried to visualize this. You, you'll see it if you read, um, some, you know, sci-fi novels, especially some, you know, there's some more obscure ones that, that do deal with this kind of thing and they're fascinating, but nobody's done visuals. And so I, uh, I think there's a lot of uncharted territory out there, and that goes back to me trying to carve out my own genre and my own space in the industry. And so it's pretty exciting. Wow. Okay, I'm, I'm a little bit speechless right now. I feel like in, in some ways you blew my mind at the depth that you're thinking about this. I've got a couple questions. Uh, first, I want to talk about the synesthesia and I forget what the others... Ideasthesia, which... Ideasthesia. How did you, how are you, is it a diagnosis or is it just like a self-aware thing that you're like, wait a second, you're reading about it and you're like, hey, this is me. Because I've, I wonder if more people might have it. I'm wondering if I might have touches of that because of the way that I, when you were saying how, you know, your love of 3D and it's like you have Legos, except you're not, you're, there's no limits. You can create any Lego piece you want. Uh, and all that's exactly how I felt about 3D. Um, it's wonderful, so you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, and I love Lego when I was a kid. But how do you? Uh, how did you come uh, to that realization yourself about the synesthesia and ideasthesia? Well, yeah, I, it's something that I'd always assumed that everybody had to some degree, and in, it's actually yeah. partially genetic. And my my brother my brother had it um, as well to a lesser degree, and we'd have arguments over what colors certain numbers were as kids. And so as a result, I kind of just assumed everyone had it. And the shapes and stuff uh, that just comes from just introspection, really really uh, thinking about it, being aware of it. And I think you're right that more people have this than they realize. Um, so, for, so for synesthesia, there are tests you can take. If you Google synesthesia battery, you can test things like color, number, associations, and that's the most common one. And there are a couple of different theories as to why it happens. Now, ideasthesia, everybody has to a degree. I, I strongly believe this. And ideasthesia is, is a little broader. It's the idea of, again, that abstract concepts um, form a mind's eye um, visual. And what I've been kind of struggling with is wondering how much of what I'm seeing is a byproduct of my thoughts, um, you know, crosstalk between different specializations um, in my brain, and how much of it is actually driving the way I think. 
And what's super fascinating is uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, or Mandelbrot, I've heard both pronunciations, the mathematician who um, first discovered fractals, uh, he was known for being able to solve mathematical problems through the shapes he saw in his mind's eye. And I was, I was kind of floored when I saw his descriptions because they were similar to mine. He, he would arrive at the answer by seeing various shapes uh, colliding together and they would do different operations on each other and you'd have a resulting shape. And he would know the answer by looking at that result shape. And I can't do that. I can get intuitions as to problem solving um, in that way, but I still have to work through the steps to get the exact answer. So I, I like to think of myself as a broken savant because I can't really do anything with what I have. It's more of a, a byproduct, but it can certainly help to think about artistic stuff. And um, But yeah, I do think that everybody has it to a degree. There, there are actually experiments that uh, have tested uh, where they show different shapes to people. One of them is very spiky and one of them is very um, blobby. And they ask people which shape is booba and which shape is kiki. And like, you know, almost 100% of people say that kiki is the spiky shape. And mm -hmm. so, so, you know, everybody has these associations. And, um, and so it's like just really trying to be in tune with that, I think, can especially help people make abstract art or apply abstract principles to illustration. Yeah. OK. So the next part about why my mind was blown was just the the depth that you're thinking about your work. And it's actually, you know, uh, maybe people are thinking this way, but they're not talking about it so much, especially not in the podcast. And I can tell that you're thinking extremely deep about this. Where did that come from? Because I think that it's something that if more people were thinking uh, on the deep level that you are, that thing that they're trying to bring out of them or that voice or that thing that's in their head, they could better, they could have more tools to work with it by, you know, doing the research, going into and, and discovering this. Is this something that came out of school? Have you always been very inquisitive? Are your parents like PhD researchers? <laughs> where, do, where do you think it comes from? Because it's, it's rare or, or at least it's rare to be talking about it um, from my experience of, of people that we've had on the podcast. Well, I'm not sure. I guess I've always um, I've always been kind of a thinker, and I, I don't really know that it, it it didn't come from my parents or school. Um, let me think about this. Could I maybe just give you an overview of my backgrounds and um, maybe try to go from there? <laughs> um, I mean, like. Oh, I I guess it's just it's more it's more of a thing, and I I, I guess I want to encourage people who are listening to to say like, hey, I can also go deeper into my work. It might not not be at the same level of, of abstraction and, and and the way that you're seeing the world, but that the, they are just encouraged to say like, yes, I can go deeper. If they if they love motorcycles, it's like. And, but they don't understand how a motorcycle is actually put together. It's like, well, you can go and start researching that and go to the you know nth degree so that you theoretically could build your own motorcycle from scratch because you've done all that research. But now you can start bringing that into your art and amazing things are going to come from your deep level of understanding now. Well, yeah, I've always loved um, just thinking about how things worked and um, thinking about things at a systems level. And... Um, I, I didn't always know if I would be doing art. You know, that I, I had other things I liked. I was also really into academics. And so that kind of inclination, I think, is maybe, you know, helping to contribute to thinking about art as well. So I don't know. It, uh, I've, it, it's a good question. I don't, I don't really know where, like, the, the kind of introspection or the, the, like, deeper thinking came from. I kind of assumed everybody thought about their work to, you know, a high degree because you spend a lot of time doing it and so what are you thinking about while you're doing it um you know i i guess there's always just this analysis engine going on in the background that's like kind of hard to shut off and i've been told that i it, you know i overanalyze and that it's it, you know it's not a good thing and so i don't know <laughs> huh no this is this is this interview is is extremely fascinating for me because it's I feel like such a rare conversation. I know you can't see my face while you're listening to this, but I'm just, as Christian's talking, I'm just like furrowing my brow and like, man, what? you're operating on a different level than a lot of people. 
And so it's just fascinating to have that conversation and to go through this process. So uh, I just want to say thank you. And I appreciate that, that we're having this conversation today because it, it is really so rare. And I hope that the, the people listening can appreciate this as well. But let's get back into talking about the art because one of the things I think that you're being very successful at is well having like a high degree of, of technical proficiency that it, the art is very interesting uh it might be a little bit difficult to describe it because it's kind of like you're saying it's its own genre but uh when you see it you're just like wow that that's really cool I, i'm i'm interested in, in seeing more in going deeper into these um trying to associate some kind of meaning with what's going on so there's uh, there's lots of cool things happening um but where do you see this fitting in and the reason that I'm asking this question is because uh, there's a lot of people who have you know, reached out in the past and they want to do something new and unique with their art. But my feeling is that they haven't been able to visualize it into something that's like, whoa, this is cool. Or, or at least I can't see it, right? And I feel like you're in a similar position um, that you're carving out something new. You're creating a new space for your art. But... The, the thing is, it is really good, or at least I can see it I, and immediately connect with it and be like, wow, this is amazing. Man, maybe I have synesthesia as well or, or whatever, and that's why I'm connecting on such a level. But what are your thoughts around this idea of, of creating your own space for this or creating something new and, and finding a place for it? Uh, well, let me, uh, let me tell you some of the things that I've been thinking of as um, ways to fit my work. And there's also a genre of work that I think that this work does kind of fit in with, but it's not, it hasn't really been covered, I think, in, in this podcast. So first off, um, there's the genre called visionary art. And so that's, um, it's associated a lot with more of the underground community. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of this kind of art at Burning Man. And what, vision, what visionary art is, is it's, um, which I had one of these pieces at Burning Man, actually. It was a big 30-foot mural, the one with the flower-like shapes. So what I mean by visionary art is uh, it's kind of, it's a very kind of, it's, it's an introspective genre. It tends to deal with the idea of mindscapes, but it also tends to be uh, very spiritual in theme. And my work is a little more like mathematical or scientific in theme. And so, but I do think that the visuals, it's kind of, it's associated with a lot of um, like just trippy imagery. And there's, there tends to be a lot of detail. Uh, and there is definitely uh, like a lot of geometry and definitely some mathematical beauty themes in it. But what visionary art tries to accomplish isn't quite what I'm trying to accomplish. I'm just saying that um, there, there are some overlaps there. And as for what I, would love to contribute to and design for, and um, I'm I'm fascinated by the implications of augmented reality. I know there's a lot of talk of virtual reality, and I want to work in that too. But um, I see augmented reality as being potentially a paradigm shift rather than an, ex an enhancement of what we already have in the form of escapism. And so uh, I can see um, there being uh, how do I put it? And I can see a visual language developing around augmented reality in which um, in which you could have, say, virtual tethers between people out in the real world that are that kind of indicate the relationship between those people or a radius around a person that when you enter that radius, you're able to get more information about them. And if you really think about this stuff, you can just you get can, you can just get this explosion of ideas of how you could how you could do this uh, kind of stuff. And you end up with some visuals that are kind of like what I'm exploring in my art. And so I really want to contribute to augmented reality. And if it means um, you know, even making my own business in that someday, um, you know, that's something, you know, like a startup or something. That's something that I think is on the table. And I've also really liked music visualization. And I think that the kind of work I do could work with that, like a next level kind of music visualization. So within the realm of virtual reality, the ability to force yourself in this place, perhaps the abstraction going on uh, where you've coded it to respond with the music um, in a way that's um, just like I said, like on, on a next level compared to what music visualization is doing now, and where you could actually interact with those shapes uh, to either maybe change the music or to just kind of vary your experience. Um, and so there, there's a lot there. And one of my regrets is uh, 
not not studying programming because I really like thinking about it. And I, I do do scripting within 3D, so I do get to scratch the programming itch. But um, the, to understand it well enough that I could hire programmers, um, I would actually uh, really like to learn it better. So what else? Music visualization, augmented reality, virtual reality. I also have some smaller side projects that I um, want to do with my art. I'm really in interested in lenticular printing. Do you know what that is? No. Uh, so what lenticular printing is, is it's, um, it's printing where you can print 3D scenes or animations in the print. So it's basically, you know, the, the holographic printing uh, where you have all those mm -hmm. little plastic ridges and as you move your head, the image changes. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to kickstart a project that is, you know, like large format of that. So you can actually see, you know, an animation of a scene as you move your head. And so... You know, that's kind of a smaller side project. So, and I'm also working on a book, uh, which is a, basically an illustrated, it's not a graphic novel, like a like comic format, but it's a book that intro introduces a science fiction world that I've been working on based on, um, it deals heavily with emergence, uh, with uh, like self-assembly and the idea of smart matter and imagining, um, oh, I can talk about some of the pitfalls of working on your own project extensively <laughs> and you've covered some of those on the podcast previously but so you know the, the the book thing is another big project I have on the back burner and I'm still freelancing so yeah lot, lots going on okay so the the next question um I think all those are, are, are great ideas like there's nothing that I would say oh that's that sounds too out there like this is all very forward thinking, very future thinking, but it's actually like already happening, right? So it's not like yeah. it's that far in the future. So, but um, compared to where most people are, like you're on, you're just on the way that you're thinking and the things that you're talking about, I would, I would call it very, would, would you say futurist is the right word or is it nowist? I, I, I don't know what the, the proper term is, but if somebody was fascinated by some of the things you're talking about, like singularity and smart matter and uh, smart assembly or self assembly, like these are all things that, um, uh, like Singularity University is talking about, and some of my friends are talking about. But I feel like, in the greater scheme of people, like if I was to talk to my mom about Singularity University, she wouldn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> yeah. But if you were to, if, would you say futurist is is kind of the something that people could look down, or is it, would you say it's more technologist that if people were interested, that they could start to educate themselves? Yeah, no, be the I, like, point? I like futurist. I, I, I think I tend to think about the present in the context of the future, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. And I'm just, I'm always branching out possibilities. And I just, I think that's the most concise way to put it is that, uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd say um, that's, that's a good term. Maybe I should like put that on my website as a branding thing. But yeah, definitely. Um, like, uh, I used to be much more about the nuts and bolts, like trying to design things, you know, exactly how they work. And lately I found myself being more high concept and, um, you know, thinking a little, um, a little further out and thinking more about the, the, the big picture of um, future st uh, stuff rather than like, oh, you know, here's exactly how this could work. And mm -hmm. so that's why, and that's, that actually was a huge breakthrough for me because um, I used to think that. Maybe it's like, you know, the, the wannabe engineer in me um, that, you know, when I designed something back, back in school, you know, when I was wanting to do more, um, you know, concept art, I would, a lot of my concepts look, looked really ugly because um, I was, I wanted to show how they worked. I didn't, I didn't put a lot of thought into the flair aspect of the design and they didn't flow well. They didn't have, they didn't, they didn't communicate anything emotionally. And so trying to step back from that and think, you know, I don't have to think about exactly how every little piece of this fits together with every other little piece. Um, it's, it, there's a lot of freedom in that. It's, it's a good feeling. So the next question I have is, that I think is, is a good question, is you're creating something new, or, or to me it's new. To, to me it's a new space, like you are saying how there's already art like this, but I don't quite and once you said it I, I've seen that art that you were talking about the more surreal kind of trippy things but I do see the more scientific uh, mathematical precision in your work versus that other uh, th that other type of work visionary artwork um, 
how are you going about getting people's eyeballs on this? How are you attracting people to this work? Because we were connected by Chris, who put on Artisticon, and you were in touch with him, which, which is great, you know, that being on podcast helps get the word out. But what are you doing individually? Because I feel like it was Chris that connected us. So it wasn't either me reaching out specifically, it wasn't you reaching out specifically. It was somebody like a third party who came in and connected. But as an artist, or or what advice would you give to somebody who's doing something similar, where they're creating a new space, and there's it might be hard to put a word on it, or it might be too cutting edge. What are you doing? Well, um, first of all, I haven't been doing this for very long, so I feel like you know my my big breakthrough piece was only earlier this year that I thought you know this is I finally landed on doing what it something that looks like what I wanted to do in my head and. You know, it, it means a lot to me. So I, um, I'm i still working on it. I've just been basically posting to social media, um, and that's, that's been about it. Um, the, the only other thing I did was by uh, putting the one piece again, the flower-like one, I printed that really big, 30 feet wide, brought it to Burning Man and um, another festival as well, a smaller one. And what I kind of did with that was what's really great about bringing your work to a place like a festival is that you can kind of hang around the work. Nobody knows you're the artist and you can listen to what other people are saying about it and watch Ooh. them react to it. And um, so that's that was a lot of fun, especially the second festival um, I went to because people would just, you know, there'd, there'd be a whole bunch of people up to it. They'd just be talking about it, trying to figure it out. And it was so cool to hear. I had a feeling that if they knew that the artist was right there, they wouldn't be talking about it in quite the same way um and so it's it's a good experience and <laughs> can you give us just some examples good or bad i feel like that that's such a great social experiment of just kind of hanging around as, as like another appreciator of the work or somebody who's confused you know whatever it is and you could even solicit you'd be like you know, I've been standing here trying to figure out this thing. What do you think it's about? You know, you could you could just preempt the conversation. Like you might be tainting it by preempting it, but who cares? It's just like it could be a fun experiment. And then as long as you know, like you have that sort of thicker skin. So like no matter what they say, because they could say something really crazy. But if you're just like, no, this is actually just a fun social experiment. Um, but do you have any examples of what people were saying? Um well, yeah, it's, there were there were people who um, some people picked up on the uh, flower of life topology that the whole city was gridded on this flower of life, which are these interlocking uh, circles. It's a it's a common symbol. Uh, it's kind of a mathematical spiritual symbol that's um, pretty common in the underground community. And so I thought that was really cool. A lot of people were trying to figure out what each of these things were. They, everybody kind of knew it was a city, and so they were like, "Well, where does the leader live? And where do the pe- where do the where's the ghetto of the city? And where's the where's the?" Um, <laughs> and so it was, and so I actually had some conversations with people where, where we we tried to figure out, you know, what each of these buildings did, and I had my own ideas of it. And so it was really cool to see, especially when other people agreed with sort of what I was trying to do. And uh, there were some other people who were clearly pretty deep into some kind of hallucinogenic and just kind of losing their minds over it, which is also a lot of fun to watch. <laughs> and uh, what else? Yeah, I, um, there, were, there were a lot of positive reactions to it, but um, at the same time, you know, I, I had someone say that I should make wallpaper out of it, which I had like, not even thought of. So I was, getting, I was getting some suggestions from people as to like, what you can do with this. And I also had this idea that, you know, I printed on this UV safe vinyl that I could sell outdoor prints. And um, you, you go to shows where collectors say, you know, I'd love to have this piece, but I don't have the wall space. And with this, I arrived at, wait a minute, you know, you could hang this out in your garden, on your fence, on your balcony, on your garage. And you, there's this whole other space that people can put art that isn't really being fully utilized. And so I was getting, I, I was definitely getting some ideas from the community, but I would really like to focus more on, say, uh, the community of people who love thinking about science, because I think that that's kind of more of the target audience I want than, like, um, you know, people who are more into, like, uh, the, the spiritual art that's associated with, like, festivals. And so... I don't know. It's I'm still working on it too. That was a very long answer, <laughs> but I'm still working on trying to get it out there and finding the right place. Um, and I am thankful for the, this podcast because that it's so it certainly it certainly helps. So yeah. Well, I, I think that's really it for me in questions. I just want to encourage people to go 
and check out Kirsten's website. I, like I, I've had it up while we've been talking here, so I've just been seeing more and more layers that if you give yourself a chance to just sit and appreciate something, there's so many layers. And, and I've particularly been looking at the, the Circle of Life uh, flower city that she's talking about. But when you see it, it's not like flowers like you're thinking in your mind right now. It's different. But once you see it, be like, oh, it's more of like sciency flowers or, or, or like mechanized flowers or, or like if flowers were incorporated yeah. into a city. So, yeah, I really encourage you to go and, and check this out. But I was wondering if you could speak one, one last final question, because I feel like you said that when you're creating your concept work, that you are more interested in how things work. Uh, we've gone over how you, you, you have a completely, or, I'm not going to say completely unique, but it's different than, different than the average bear. <laughs> we'll use that phrase, uh, view of the world and the, the way that you're going so deep and, with, with thinking about these ideas and, and the research behind it. And I feel like there was a point on your website where you could just pinpoint and say, like, that's where I did my first piece. Like you were saying earlier this year, you had your first kind of breakthrough piece. And if somebody has yet to kind of discover their voice, because as soon as you see Kirsten's site, you'll just be like, wow, this art is amazing. And then you'll see some of the other art and you'll just be like, yeah, I don't think you, you are meant to be concepting cars, you know, for example. <laughs> you can do it. You know, no one's saying that you can't do it. It's just like, you're really good at this other thing. You do more of that. I don't know where it's going to go, but that is you. Whoa. So for somebody who hasn't found that thing, can is there anything that, that was special about that time or different that happened that allowed you to m- make that leap or that transition? Well, let's see. So... When I when I graduated, I, uh, I had a very diverse portfolio, and I like doing a lot of different things. And so I said yes way too much. So I um, I have done in the past I've done fantasy and interior illustration, game concept art, industrial design and architectural design, advertising illustration and concept art like for commercials, scientific illustration, amusement park design, UI design, kind of brainstorming game design, gaming box art. All, magic art, I'm starting on a film. I've done a lot of different kinds of stuff. And so um, I think by doing that, maybe that helped me have a better sense of scope as to just what all is out there and, and how this whole art and design thing works. And that this is my, my justification for not having enough of a direction when I graduated, was that I didn't, by not focusing on one thing, I didn't ascend the totem pole in any one sub-industry. Um, mm-hmm. But by doing that, I think maybe it just helped me think about things better and um, have that, that sense of knowing what I really wanted to do almost through process of elimination because I've done almost everything else to, to some degree. So I think maybe just trying a bunch of different things and just trying to integrate all of those together in some way in your head maybe helps to think about this kind of thing. Is, does that <laughs> – I, I, what exactly was the question again? <laughs> Just, just for, you know, uh, I, I, there's a saying, and I'm going to butcher it here, but the saying goes something like, there's nothing as pitiful as an artist who has yet to find his or her voice. Yeah. And so for those people who are trying to do more, go down more of the fine art or, uh, you know, it doesn't, I, I feel like for what you're doing, it, it could possibly have a commercial application, but I can't think of one quite yet. Whereas, let's say we're talking about uh, designing icons, you know, like you, you, UI design. There's a, there's a very clear like, oh, mobile phones use, need that, video games need that, computers need that. There's all these applications. So for somebody who's trying to go like chart their own path, but has yet to find their voice, okay. was there a, I, I think was there I a real like question? Um, yeah. So I have a couple of pieces of advice for that, and the one is to really embrace um, play and to to um, and I know that's like a really Kind of vague advice, but um, to really to get a sense of um, ex- uh, let me try to better explain what I mean by play. Um, trying, I think that's fine. Uh, yeah, just like just like not taking things so serious, um, throwing out the rules, breaking the rules, inventing your own rules, using colors that you wouldn't think would go together, trying new tools that you don't know how to use. Yeah, or in the act of you know doing something that you think is a bad idea, and then the act of damage control of trying to actually make that work, you can grow a lot and um, really like understand how you think about things and what you're all about. Um, and but yeah, yeah, by yeah by play, I mean you know just 
just really experimenting and trying things when you don't know exactly how they're going to come out. You know, experiments is another way uh, of putting that. And um, just keep doing that. And, <laughs> and if you see my sketchbook, it's, um, it's a lot of really, really little things, little doodles, and they, they network together. I, I have this way of ideating that I think I'll share because I think um, it's something anyone can do that you start with a seed, you start with, say, a little drawing, and you label that drawing, you label what it's about, how it works, and you find that every one of those labels prompts another drawing that explains the label. And so you do another drawing, and you just keep working out, and sort of, it's almost like a concept web, and you draw lines to connect different concepts that are similar to each other, and it's like a, a mind map is what I'm talking about. So it's a kind of a alternating mind map between, like, left brain, you know, analytical stuff and visual stuff and you end up growing all these little ideas in the sketchbook until it's full like a, a petri dish <laughs> i like to think of my little drawings as like bacteria or um and because <laughs> it, it ends up looking kind of like that um and what i'm saying is that by doing that enough you just end up bathed in all these different ideas and then you start to ask okay which one of these is important to me so do that a lot um that, would probably help but there wasn't like a like a single it wasn't like a leap it was just a like no. a gradual process of playing experimenting yes um just letting things be and then it, it just somehow naturally came out of you that and combined with what you what you just said in your other answer was you know by process of el elimination trying a lot of different things so you had a lot of experience in various things yeah and and, and even though it would be hard to to quantify or say exactly like what what you took from those that, that led you here, it, it all was part of the process of, of evolving and then just out of this, I, I can't go back into your history, um, but just like the image history to see, was it a progression or was it like one day you're drawing cars and the next day it's like, boom, Flower City? Uh, uh, no, well, let, let, me, uh, let me think about this for a sec. Uh, a, a third thing I wanted to say that just occurred to me is about um, non-art inspiration. And I think it's really important. There, some people are they're very single-minded about making art, but in order to really, uh, in order to really have some of these ideas, you need to look beyond art. You need to look at you know read nonfiction books about you know science or history, and be a nerd about certain topics that have nothing to do with art. And I really believe in cross-disciplining that the that you know, richness comes from, like conceptual richness comes from taking two disparate things and finding the connections between them. And I strongly believe that creativity is really an, an exercise of analogy making. It's, um, it's finding those common threads between things and saying, this is like that because of X, you know, concept. And so by really feeding your mind with just stuff that's, you know, again, not specifically about painting or drawing, you're going to find this stuff. I mean, the world is just a fascinating place. I try not to look too much at, you know, other concept artists when I'm thinking about ideas because there's just, it's better to go to the source and multiple sources, not just one source, but put two desperate sources together. And I, I recommend keeping a Pinterest. Uh, I have over 25,000 images on my Pinterest. And most of them are, you know, from, from you know, photography and, you know, organisms and minerals and and I just have all these different categories and you can look at those things and just like get a, a lot of senses of you can look at your overall Pinterest and say like what is it that makes my collection of images I really like what is it that holds them together what are some of the common things in there that I'm just drawn to and so doing that I, I like that site because it feeds you just a, a lot of different stuff it's not you don't get caught in a rut too much of certain things so you so, so, that, so that's part of it is being a curator I guess of um, the world so I wanted to answer that and to your question about you know you're doing all these different things and then boom flower city um, I think if you saw my sketchbook which I should post more like sketchbook stuff online you would kind of get a better sense of like you know all the stuff going on in my head that could lead to something like flower city um, so it's just you know a lot of sketching a lot of doodling a lot of figuring out like what what shapes do I like? What designs work together in a way that just makes sense to me? And yeah. <laughs> I think that's a great answer and probably the perfect place to stop. I, I would love to have you back for another uh, another recording because I'm just fascinated by the way that you 
think about the world. Um, but we'll we'll give it a bit of time to let this what you're doing. I don't know if there's a name for it quite <laughs> yet, but we'll, we'll let what you're doing like keep going a little bit further, and then and then have you back to see how things are going because I'm really curious to see to hear the update of of creating a new space for yourself. It's really it's really unique and and interesting thing, and I wish you all the best with this. Well, thank you. I um, I definitely feel like I'm sort of on the cusp of a lot of things and um, sort of a precipice. And there's a lot of different directions that I'm, I can go in. And I have a big problem, uh, which is I start a lot of things. And I'm just, there's so many things I want to do that I have a hard time prioritizing just one thing and finishing it. And so I think if you have, I can't say exactly what I'll have actually um what I'm going to do first, but um, I think a follow-up would, um, I, I, I was just, I was thinking that, you know, maybe I was a little worried that this podcast might be early, that I, I haven't done all, you know, I'm, I'm about to do a whole bunch of, I've, I, I've arranged everything so that I will be doing a lot of this stuff, but a lot of it I haven't done yet, so I was afraid that I, you know, I wasn't qualified to, to talk on this podcast in a way, um, but, so I, the point is, I think a follow-up sounds good. <laughs> Yeah. Well, why don't you give people the best places to find you online, and then we'll be wrapped up for today. All right. Um, so first off, a, a better place to view my actual art might be ArtStation, because I have some higher res versions and process shots. Um, so what I recommend is if you go to my website, um, and you go to the Connect tab, um, I have links to all of you know my different social media presences. So I think the best place to find me is... Uh, uh, to follow me as Facebook. I've been participating more on Instagram, um, ArtStation. Uh, those are kind of my three. If you want to follow my inspiration, go to my Pinterest and you can find just a lot of the stuff I like and collect and look at and I kind of get a better sense of what drives me. So yeah. Perfect. And we'll have links to everything over at pencilkings.com slash podcast as usual. And um, thank you so much, Kristen. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to the update, maybe six months or so. All right. Sounds like a plan. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Don't demand patience, skill, years of practice. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.